Internet looking at the issue of climate change or global warming. Uh, and it's baffling to many people that uh, the United States is considered uh, the most scientifically oriented and technologically developed country in the world. And yet on an issue that seems to be a scientific issue, such as, is the climate getting warmer? Uh, are we, is the, uh, the globe in which we live uh, changing? Uh, there is no consensus. There are lots of data that come from uh, different directions. One of the interesting points is that if you go back maybe a year, 80% uh, of the people in the United States thought that that issue was pretty well settled, and yes, uh, climate change and global warming is a reality. Uh, but if you look at that number today, it's only about 50%. Uh, so some 30% of the people apparently uh, have changed their mind. Uh, this is an issue on which uh, the people on the stage have had some comment, particularly Don. Uh, so I'm going to ask you that uh, uh, this past week, the National Climatic Data Center came out with a report saying that over the last decade, the decade of, two, of the 2000s, was the, the warmest on record. Uh, you've been reported as saying that global warming is a hoax and a Ponzi scheme. When you hear a report, I don't know if that's true, I haven't heard it directly myself. You will know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> that's your setup, folks. Here it comes. Sorry. Even if you believe that it's a hoax and a Ponzi scheme, if you hear a report come out that, say, that says that uh, for all of the recorded years that we have for temperature, that the last decade was the warmest, can you accept that as being a fact that you have to deal with? No, because uh, the United Nations uh, used to use 6,000 spots before 2005 to take temperatures, and now they use 1,000. Many of you have heard about Climate Gate, which is where the uh, it's been discovered that the scientists were covering up data that disputed their findings. But the real issue is not whether the climate's getting warmer or cooler, because that happens all the time. The issue is whether it's man-made global warming, which is clearly not. The, the next issue would be, is it American-made global warming, which is clearly not. And the next issue is if Americans quit burning coal and parked all their cars and sat in the cold, would the temperature of the earth change? And I can tell you it would not because the Chinese and the Asians would re, re, you know, replace the carbon emissions in a matter of a few months. It's all totally nonsensical. When you look at it, regardless of, of what the climate's going to do, uh, you're not going to be able to do anything about it. And what's happening is a lot of people are trying to make money off of it with solar panels and windmills and all these discussions about things that make no sense. You know, the, the problem you've got is that probably 10% of the people in China or less have a car, something like 60 or 70% of Americans have a car. When the Chinese get all their cars, the carbon emissions are going to go way up regardless of what you do to the coal industry in this country. Uh, we can't manufacture anything in this country already because of environmental constraints and other constraints that are put on us in the law. If we don't stay competitive and we keep our borders open to free trade, we're not going to have any workers. As I've said before, the endangered species is the American worker. And the problem you've got, it's a hoax because it clearly anyone that says that they know what the temperature of the Earth is going to be in 2020 or 2030 needs to be put in an asylum because they don't. And the second thing about it is anybody thinks that you're going to change that, that this thing they've been saying in Washington, they're going to keep the temperature down by two degrees, that they have some sort of a thermostat where they're going to control the temperature of the Earth, they clearly don't. And the Asians and the Africans behind them are going to use fossil fuels to generate the electricity they need to eat and to have drinkable water and to do the things that we've been doing in this country. This whole thing is designed to transfer wealth from the U.S. to other countries, most of the countries in the United Nations that vote on this don't even have a climatologist or a meteorologist that knows anything about it. What they know is they're going to get more money from the United States, and that's what it's really about. You, you don't have to respond, but you may. Uh, I, I'll, I'll respond. Let, let me respond to, because I don't really want to engage in a, in a discussion between two non-scientists about global warming. Uh, I, I'll respond to the, 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 the first supposition first, that. It was environmentalists who were robbing jobs you know, of the American workers and endangered species. 
There's 90,000 workers in West Virginia in the mining industry, miners, who have lost their jobs since 1954. None of them lost their jobs because of environmental regulations. They lost their jobs because of an industry that is ruthlessly efficient, that is intent on eliminating every mining job that it possibly can eliminate, uh, so that, and, and, and mining coal with machinery. On the issue of global warming, I'll, I'll say the same reply. Uh, you know, a lot of this is kind of flat earth stuff. I don't agree with you that there is any um, doubt about the consensus. There is a consensus. 98% of the research climatologists in the world say that global warming is real, that it's caused by us, that it's happening now, that its impacts are going to be catastrophic. There are 2% who disagree with that. Some of them, though not all, are paid for by Exxon and the carbon cronies. Some of them have other reasons for saying that, and maybe they believe it. But I have a choice of believing the 98% or the 2%. If you believe my 98% and we go ahead and try to reduce our carbon, we've gotten rid of a dirty fuel, we've made ourselves energy independent, we've made our, improved our national security, we've improved prosperity and quality of life and health for American citizens. If we believe Mr. Blankenship and his 2% and they're wrong, the whole of civilization is destroyed. So, you know, it just makes sense to me to go with the 98% because the costs of doing that are not great to our country. Um, I, I want to say one other thing about these emails that have been kind of the darling of the right, um, which is the, there were some emails that were robbed from East Anglia University, which is one of the many, many research centers for global warming. Um, if you interpret a few, there's tens of thousands of release, there's two or three of them that were held up as, as evidence of, of some kind of fraud. If you believe the worst interpretations of those emails, which I don't, if you read the whole email, they're, they're pretty innocent. Um, but if you did believe it, it still doesn't matter, it still doesn't change the science because the very same question, which was the historical trends in global warming, were studied by seven other major research organizations, including the Internet, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the United States National Academy of Sciences, and a special organization of scientists that were put together by President Bush. And they all came to exactly the same conclusion. So this is a tempest in a teapot. I want to take a... It's true that neither one of us are scientists, but the math is pretty simple. The United States mines less than 1 billion tons of gold. The rest of the world mines 6.5 billion tons of gold. Uh, their growth rate is in the neighborhood of three to 400 million tons per year. Do you think shutting down the U.S. coal industry or limiting the U.S. coal industry is going to lower the temperature of the earth? I don't think so. The idea that the environmental movement hasn't cost coal miners jobs probably not true because a lot of the windmill subsidies and the solar panel subsidies have taken part of the market. But we go, let me go back to the most fundamental thing. It's easy to say that the industry is evil, the industry is ruthless, the industry is destroying the climate and destroying the environment. You are the industry. The, the people in this room, the people that are in the banks, the people that are working in the coal mines, the people, we're the ones that are making the decision. I'm a guy that will this year go into a coal mine for the sixth decade. I will have been in coal mines in six decades. I went into them as a teenager. I've been around it for a long time and I've seen everything from hand, hydraulic hand drills all the way to drag lines. So I know what this industry has done to advance productivity. I know what it has done to advance environmental uh, consciousness. I know what it has done to advance safety. The idea that industry, which is a word that I don't know what it means other than the people in this state that are trying to run these coal mines and produce domestic energy so that the terrorists won't blow us up and so that we can have jobs instead of having them all be transferred to China and India. We are the industry. You are the industry. The people that are your neighbors and your, and your teachers, again, are the industry. So I don't know what it is that we want to be so easily critical of the industry because that is us. If you let me, uh, I want to take another, uh, uh, we've weaved coal in and out of global warming. 
Uh, another issue I think is pretty important, and I wanted to pass on to you a question that was raised saying, uh, we've been changing the tops of hills and mountains for years. We've called it excavation, community development, and economic progress. We've built schools, hospitals, shopping centers, and houses. Why don't we view mountaintop mining the same way? And related to that, I mean, is there any way in your judgment that uh, reclamation could be done in a way that would be satisfactory to you? Um, I, I, the, the answer to your first question is just the scale of it. I mean, to cut down, um, you know, a million acres, 2,000 square miles of a sacred mountain range. I, I, I'll tell you something about the Appalachians. During the Pleistocene Ice Age 20,000 years ago, when there were two and a half miles of ice above the place where I live in Mount Kisco, New York, the rest of North America became a tundra. And all the trees disappeared except in one tiny refugium in the mountains of eastern Kentucky and West Virginia. And after the ice withdrew 12,000 years ago, all of North America was reseeded from those seed stocks. And that's why these mountains are so important. It's the, they're the most biologically abundant forest, temperate forest on the planet. A, a typical forest all over the world has three dominant, one to three dominant species of trees. This Appalachia has 80 dominant species of trees. There's more, uh, there's more biological diversity per cubic meter than any place on Earth. And now this company is doing what the glaciers couldn't do, which is flattening those landscapes. There's been 7,000 valley fills. And you know they talk about reclamation, economic reclamation. We need more flat land in West Virginia. We got plenty, by the way, in Kansas. But they say we need more flat land in West Virginia. But there's about a dozen of those valley of those flat mountains that have actually been used by, for economic development. There's a few of those that have been reclaimed. Some of the smaller ones that were done a long time ago, where they put the soil, the topsoil aside put it back on, and then the neighboring trees provided the seed stock. But when you have a five-mile fill, there's no way ever that that will ever be this, uh, restored. And the Army Corps of Engineers in the Chambers case, which was against Massey Cole, the chief expert for the Army Corps of Engineers said that it had never, that, it, that restoring a stream had never been done. And you will never see the Appalachian Mountains on those reclaimed sites ever in history, ever, ever again. We've lost them completely forever. The question that I would leave to with, with Don is this, that you, in, in order to do this, you have to violate the law, in my view. You have had, in between 2000 and 2006, you had 70,000 violations of the Clean Water Act. There are also numerous violations of SMACRA and NEPA and you know, uh, mining, health and safety and all these other statutes. But there were 70,000 violations of the Clean Water Act. EPA, the, uh, George Bush's EPA, even that George Bush's EPA said this, we can't do this. And find the biggest fine Clean Water Act penalty in history, $20 million against Massey Coal. And they told us that's gonna be enough to keep them from doing it again. But this year, Joe Lovett, this week, <clears throat> sent a letter of intent to sue for just one year as a violation this last year, a 12,900 violations, a greater concentration than even before the $20 million fine. My question to, to you, Don, is it possible to do mountaintop removal without violating the law? And you've said yourself, that you know, a couple of years ago, you said it was, impo it was impossible to, uh, that 90% of your trucks were breaking the law by being illegally overloaded by coal, and you said there are some laws that are just unreasonable, and I'm not gonna comply with them. Is that how you view the Clean Water Act? It's interesting, you've obviously been talking to a few plaintiff attorneys. Uh, <laughs> first of all, I don't know anything about 12,700 violations. The count on EPA exceedances that I've seen is about 1,120 uh, you know, in the recent year, these 580. Are EPA, these are your own violations yes. that Massey filed in its report saying that you, you yourself, violated the Clean Water Act in one year 12,900 times. This isn't EPA accusing you, this is you saying you did it. All right, so let me, I think there's 11 points that you made. One is that 
the destruction that's being done to the mountains is so large that it couldn't be a place to build homes or whatever. The fact of the matter is the, the, the area disturbed is less than the size of Houston, and I've not seen a post-mining land use for Houston yet. It's the same true all over the country. The urban development moved, uh, pours concrete on far more land than we have here, and the fact of the matter is there's more forest land in West Virginia today than there was in 1960, and there's more forest land in the United States than 1960. I was real pleased to hear that Mr. Kennedy didn't blame me for the climate change that caused the Ice Age to recede 20,000 years ago. <laughs> because I, I, I'm, you know, it's interesting that they, that they know that geologically speaking, the, the earth has been covered with ice at different times. In fact, when I was a kid, there was two things that they told us. The Ice Age is going to kill us, and if a nuclear bomb comes, get under your desk. I mean, it, 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 the EPA and the government can be questioned. That's the beauty of this country. Uh, the other thing is that uh, he talks about violating the law. We submit our water samples uh, continually. We have ever since I've been in the business. Uh, we had not heard any issue with that from the EPA under Clinton, under the previous administrations, and so we were reporting. If we have a, a water sample that looks like this, that's one part per million out on iron, and we take a sample and don't take another sample for 30 days, it was considered 30 violations. You could drink this water. It's cleaner than a lot of the water that's in the wells. The real problem with, the real problem with uh, stream contamination in this state is we're all sewage. Human sewage goes directly into the streams in West Virginia, and it's the largest pollutant of the streams. If the environmentalists, if the EPA wanted to improve the quality of life and the quality of water in West Virginia, they would put the 45% of the households that don't have uh, city water and don't have city sewage on a system. It would cost about a billion dollars, which is one fiftieth of what we spent on Iraq, in Iraq on similar projects. If the Enviros really wanted to prove the health and environment, they would, that's the type of thing that they would be promoting. They wouldn't be worrying about one part per million of iron or silt in some discharge out of a pond. Uh, again, the violation numbers, uh, we are greatly reducing the violation numbers now that we've been uh, told that they need to be addressed. But the thing that about this industry is it improves every year only for the hurdle to be made higher. Again, you are the ones that work in it. The West Virginians are the ones that work in it. Coaches and teachers and Sunday school teachers are the ones that work in it. We're doing everything we can to comply with a different law every day. And as I told someone today, when it's news that this industry gets one permit, there's a problem because it's this industry that has the best opportunity and provides the best possibility of decreasing our dependency on foreign energy. And these environmental movements that are constantly raising the bar, uh, the e uh, current EPA, which won't give a permit for anything for any reason, uh, they won't specify even what it takes to get a permit, they're the ones that's going to cost people their jobs and weaken this country's homeland security and the ones that the churches should be questioning. Let me just, uh, 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 you didn't answer my question. Which was? First of all, the Clean Water Act has not been changed since 1970. And second of all, your own records show that your record of Clean Water Act compliance is not improving, it's getting worse. 12,900 violations a single year according to your records. My question to you, and I know you're an honest person, and two trial attorneys said to me, one thing about Don Blankenship, well, he's an honest trial. man. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, two people who had deposed you. Right. They said one thing about him, he's the most honest CEO in America when it comes to answering questions about his company. I want to ask you this question. Is it possible to do mountaintop removal mining without violating the law? I doubt that it's possible without having a single violation at a single time, but if anybody can do it, this industry in West Virginia can do it. Is it possible it. to do it without 5, 12,000 violations in a year? Is yes. it possible? And if it's not possible to do it without 12,000 violations, then why aren't you doing it? We are doing it. We will reduce our violations considerably year over year. We already have. The Sierra Club's claims that we haven't reduced violations is false. Uh, it's your, it's a, your own records, No, John. it's not our own records. The Sierra Club... No, it's your discharge monitoring reports that you have to fill out every day. It's not Sierra Club. All they did was compile your records, and they show that your record is getting worse You're every already year. on record as saying I'll tell you the truth. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm telling you <laughs> that...
The Sierra Club made the claim in preparation for this debate, I suspect, that we had had an increase in violations since the EPA accord and settlement that we had with them. The truth of the matter is just the opposite. We've reduced the violations 30 or 40 percent. We will continue to reduce them. The records I saw in the last few days is we had two of the EPA violations in the last two weeks. Keep in mind, we do tell the truth because these are self-reported samples. We took the samples, we submitted them, we were told they were out of spec. If you had a violation today because you took a water sample and sent it in, and, and even though we had never been told this before, at least I had no knowledge of it, and it went 30 days, you got 30 violations. You can, the, the problem you've got is that the EPA rules are unreasonable, the enforcement is unreasonable, in many cases the safety enforcement is unreasonable, and it, it's causing this country to be non-competitive, it's costing us our jobs, it will cost the teachers their pension plan uh, if, they, if we don't begin to have a little bit of common sense and quit worrying about water that looks like this while we're dumping straight pipe sewage right in our creeks. Okay, we're getting, uh, we're going to do a final con uh, comments by each person, so we're getting close to that. Uh, the last question I'd throw at you for a very brief response is, uh, there are probably not very many people that I know who have both of you on their party invitation lists. <laughs> and my question would be, are there any points where you believe that you have agreement either in methodology or uh, uh, in an understanding about where we are with regard to the use of energy in its future? It sounds as if we have some agreement on the fact that the world has to be part of the solution, not just the United States, and that we have to have a competitive industry if we're going to compete in a free world. So I think there's some agreement there. I would have hoped that Mr. Kennedy and uh, Mr. Gore and all these other uh, people that espouse this environmental uh, stuff are basically mistaken as opposed to evil, because the bottom line is, if we don't agree that homeland security, good use of our energy, low cost electricity for our houses, low cost uh, gas, natural gas for our industry, jobs, good households, high quality of life are the objective, then I don't know how, you know, how to speak about it. Because if we don't agree on that, then we're fundamentally on different pages. Are there points of agreement, Bobby? Well, I agree with a lot of Don's rhetoric. I don't know, I, I, but I think there's a big gap between his rhetoric and what I see happening on the ground in these communities. The two places I think that I know that, that I believe we agree is one on free trade. I think we both oppose it. And second, um, I think we both think that carbon sequestration, geological carbon sequestration is a joke. I appreciate that. He's right about one thing. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> if there was uh, one thing that you wanted people to do after hearing this debate, what do you want them to do? Um, I, you know, I think that we all have a, is this our last comment or is this just well, a quick? This is not your wrap up speech. This is the last I, question. I, 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 you know what? It's what I, Henry it David Thoreau, when he was locked in in the, um, in the Concord jail in uh, protesting the, the, uh, the Spanish-American War. Uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson came to the, uh, to the window of the jail and said to him, what are you doing in there, David? And he said, what are you doing out there, Ralph? We all, this is the worst environmental crime that's ever happened in our history. It's a crime not against the, just the environment, but against democracy, the capture of these agencies that are, that are no longer functioning as, as part of our democracy, the destruction of these communities. It is a crime, it's a sin, it's a moral obligation, and we all have to every obligation to, to use everything in our power to try to stop this from continuing. Don, you have a minute and a half, two minutes to say what you want as part of a wrap-up. I think the, the main thing, again, to remember is that the environmental movement represents itself as the savior of mankind, and that it's not true. The savior is going to be productivity and efficiency and creating a quality of life for people that they can enjoy, both in the United States and the rest of the world. Unfortunately, Mr. Kennedy only knows about poverty from what he read in the books. He doesn't, hasn't experienced it firsthand. It's, uh, it's a very unpleasant experience. Most of us in this room uh, think that we've experienced a touch of it or witnessed a touch of it, but we haven't. Again, millions of people starve to death in the world. If you go to India, 420 million people live without electricity. 
and they have, don't even have the dignity and privacy of a place to go to the bathroom. Uh, it's a very sad situation in the world, and it's getting to be a sad situation in this country. And the bottom line, I go back to the mission statement. The mission statement of the energy policy in this country are to be able to, cr to create a higher quality of life and keep us safe. To do that, you have to make a good use of the resources that we have, recover as much of them as you can, and, and conserve the power. You have to pay attention to the environment in a pragmatic, realistic way. You have to have low-cost electricity, and you have to produce the industry in this country so that you don't have to depend on your enemies for that, for that energy. Those are fundamental things upon which you have to make your decisions. And as far as asking you all to do something, look at the facts. You know, if you look at 6.5 billion tons of coal used elsewhere in the world to raise their quality of life, it's not going to be possible to change the temperature of the earth by limiting industry in this country and taking people's jobs away. Okay. You have about a minute and a half. Okay. I, I, um, Don says that we have to choose between environmental protection on the one hand and economic prosperity on the other. Um, I say that's a false choice in 100% of the times good environmental policy is identical to good economic policy if we want to measure our economy, and this is how we ought to be measuring it, based upon how it produces jobs and the dignity of jobs over the generations, over the long term, and how it preserves the value of the assets of our community. If, on the other hand, we want to do what his company and Don himself have been urging us to do, which is to treat the planet as if it were a business in liquidation, convert all of our natural resources to cash as quickly as possible, have a few years of pollution-based prosperity, we can generate an instantaneous cash flow and the illusion of a prosperous economy. But our children are going to pay for our joyride, and they're going to pay for it with denuded landscapes and poor health and huge cleanup costs that are going to amplify over time and that they'll never be able to pay. Environmental injury, particularly of the kind that's happening today in West Virginia, is deficit spending. It's a way of loading the cost of our generation's prosperity onto the backs of our children. And one of the things that I've done over the past 25 years as an environmental advocate is to constantly go around and confront this argument, Don's argument, that an investment in our environment is a diminishment of our nation's wealth. It isn't. It's, a, it's an investment in infrastructure, the same as investing in telecommunications and road construction. It's an investment we have to make if we're going to ensure the economic vitality of our generation and the next generation. What I would say to the coal industry is go underground, employ lots of people, and do this safely in a way that can bring prosperity as, tr as West Virginia makes a transition to a new energy future and to the prosperity that that's going to bring the state. Two people have obviously come together. To okay. We brought two people together to express their points of view. I don't think there is a need for an altar call to recognize conversions tonight. Uh, but there has uh, been candor, and I hope that it has broadened your understanding about the issues uh, that we have discussed. Uh, I thank uh, lots and lots of people who made this uh, possible tonight. Thank you in the audience for being cooperative and allowing them to talk and share with me, and thanking uh, Don Blankenship and Bobby Kennedy and being here on the stage tonight. Thank you all, and good evening. <laughs>